beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, we're not always very motivated to do the things that we should. If you ask kids to do chores around the house, they're usually not very eager to do them. But if you promise a reward, they'll often be much more keen to do them. If we're faced with writing a paper or studying for a test at school, we'll often procrastinate. But thinking about failing the assignment or test is often enough to get us in gear and help us to do our work. When we face difficult tasks at work, we may avoid doing them, perhaps because we doubt our abilities or because we're already stressed and burnt out. But if the boss comes alongside to help you get started and promises a reward for finishing in time, we're often able to do the job. It's the same with the Christian life. We're not always motivated to live our lives to the glory of God. It's much easier to go along with what others are doing and so get along with them even if what they're doing is wrong. The short-term pleasures of sin can entice us to do what we know we shouldn't. We sometimes need an incentive to live the Christian life. As a wise pastor who's experienced much of life, Peter recognizes this. It's why he started his letter as he did, assuring his readers of the wondrous grace God had already shown them and reminding them and us of the glorious inheritance in store for us. He wanted to provide a basis, a motivation for why we are to live the Christian life. In our text, Peter issues three commands about how we as Christians are to live our lives. What these commands are is not super clear in the English translations, for they translate several helping verbs as imperatives. But in the Greek, three clear commands are given. Verse 13, set your hope fully on the grace that will be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. Verse 15, be holy in all your conduct. And verse 17, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. As Peter gives these commands, he continues to provide motivation for doing them. He reminds us from what we've been delivered, the cost of our deliverance, and the future in store for us. I preach to you God's word under the following theme. As born-again Christians who are exiles in this world, Peter instructs us on how we are to live before God. Peter calls us to live in hope, to live in holiness, and to live in holy fear. Our text begins with the word, therefore. It's a clue that what is coming is based on what has just been said. And so it's worthwhile to reflect on the message Peter has already communicated to his readers. In the verses leading up to our text, he has assured them that they are God's elect children, chosen to be his own from before the foundation of the world. He has reminded them of the fact that although most of them were formerly pagans who lived sinful lives, they had been born again. God had begun a new work in them working in their hearts and lives by his word and spirit. Peter shared the joy of salvation and the hope of sharing in the inheritance that the Lord has in store for us. Yet the Christians Peter addressed faced many struggles and hardships in their lives. They were exiles or strangers in the world. Many of them had been displaced from other lands and moved by Emperor Claudius to live in the dispersion But it's not living in a new land with different language and different customs that was the hardest thing for these Christians. What made their lives difficult was that they were not accepted by the society in which they lived. You know why not? It's because they were Christians. It's because they believed in one God 
rather than worshiping a pantheon of made-up gods. It's because they lived according to God's commands. Instead of following society and its sinful practices, they were despised and rejected and oppressed and persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. You can understand, beloved, that because of this, there was always pressure for these new Christians to conform to society. There was pressure for them to think and act like others around them, to just go along with the flow instead of always sticking out and being different. We can relate to that, can't we? When classmates or workmates are blaspheming the Lord's name, It's hard to be the one to speak out against this. When people are telling an off-color joke, it's easier to laugh along than walk away. When people speak about sensitive topics like abortion or medical aid in dying, it's difficult to speak up for life. Letting the light of the gospel shine on an ungodly and decadent society opens us up for ridicule and slander. The first command that Peter gives us is, set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's struggling readers needed to fix their focus on heaven, from where they await the Lord Jesus Christ. They needed to look forward with eager anticipation to Christ's return on the clouds of heaven. Why did Peter give this command? His readers were struggling and suffering. Many of them were poor. They were oppressed. They were alienated by others around them because they didn't fit in with the rest of their society. What should we as Christians do when facing trials and sorrows, discouragement, perhaps even hopelessness? Peter says, set your hope fully on the glorious future God has promised you. It's a command that we feel full, strong hope that when Jesus comes again, we will experience the riches of salvation. Peter wants us to be supremely confident about the final outcome of our lives, that we will experience God's grace in its fullness, that his grace will be all-satisfying. Remember, beloved, that Peter is providing his readers with motivation for living their lives to God's glory. It's hard to be motivated to love and serve God when it feels like God isn't near and isn't blessing us. In the midst of trials and sorrows, we can more easily be tempted to grab what we can in life, that we may experience a bit of pleasure or satisfaction out of life. But Peter wants us to look at the big picture He doesn't want us to be led astray or to give in to the temptations of sin. And so he tells us to set our hope fully on the wondrous salvation God has in store for us in the life to come. He's teaching us a proper perspective from which to live life. Peter doesn't just tell us to set our hope fully on the glorious inheritance that awaits us. He also tells us how to do so. Our text speaks of preparing your minds for action. It's understandable that the English translates the Greek in this way, but it doesn't present a full picture of what's being said. Literally, the Greek says, gird up the loins of your mind. You need to understand that people in the ancient Near East dress differently than we do. Instead of wearing pants, men wore loose robes. Such robes worked well for ordinary life, but they easily got in the way if you wanted to run or to fight or to perform strenuous labor. To gird the loins is to wrap the flowing garments around your waist with a belt and so gain freedom of movement to run or work hard. The Lord told the Israelites to eat the Passover with loins girded and sandals on their feet So they'd be ready to to flee Egypt at any moment. Jesus alluded to this passage when he commanded his followers to be ready for his return. He said, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning 
and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast, that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. In our text, Peter is making it clear, our minds must be focused. Our minds need to be focused on Christ. We, beloved, live in a world of distractions. Our daily work can easily become an idol, consuming our thoughts and attention. In our time away from work, we're often looking for a good time. We give our attention to how our favorite teams are performing, or to the show that we enjoy watching, or to what others are doing on social media. Some years ago, Neil Postman wrote a book titled, Amusing Ourselves to Death. He predicted that modern technologies with their screens full of images would undo our capacity to think and focus on what's important in life. He was right. Many in our society have become shallow people who believe whatever the media feeds them. Even we as Christians often have difficulty holding on to godly perspectives in life. Our text is teaching us to get rid of any clutter in our minds that could distract us from Christ's return. In our text, Peter also exhorts us to be sober-minded, that we may set our hope fully on Christ's return and the coming glory he will bring. The word Peter uses is the opposite of being drunk. Alcohol befuddles the mind. It takes away the ability to think things through in a rational manner and causes people to act irresponsibly. And it's not just alcohol that can do that. Our emotions often do that too. I'm sure you've heard the saying that love is blind. Being in love can cloud people's perspectives and often causes them to make bad decisions. Anger does the same. We nurse a grievance against someone. It's easy to say and do things that we may regret for the rest of our lives. And think about how fear can take hold of a person's life so they become a nervous wreck, unable to function properly. It's easy for us to be drunk with the things of this world. Our life can be consumed with worldliness or selfishness or the pleasures that this life has to offer. If we're not clear-minded, if our focus is not on God and his rich promises in Jesus Christ, we're in danger of being led astray. And so Peter calls his readers to be sober-minded. They've been born again to a living hope a hope focused on Jesus Christ and the riches we have in him. Peter wants us to view life from this perspective. He wants us to find the fulfillment of our deepest longings in Christ alone. He wants us to experience true satisfaction in life. He wants us to live in hope of the coming glory. Do you live that way, beloved? Is it possible for you to break out of the daily mindset that's so easily preoccupied with all the things of this life? Do you take time to focus your minds on what's truly important in life? To ponder on the Lord Jesus Christ's mighty deeds of salvation and what they mean for you? If your minds are not set on Christ... You will not be able to live for him. If your hearts don't love the Lord Jesus, there's no way that you're going to be devoted to him. What we do, how we live, it's determined by our hearts and our minds. Distraction and self-focus lead to ungodly living. That's why Peter commands us to live in hope of the coming glory. God has promised us. Brings us to our second point. And we'll see how Peter calls us to live in holiness. In our text, Peter commands, but just as he who called you is holy, 
So be holy in all you do. What does it mean to be holy? Our text provides a contrast to holiness in verse 14, where Peter tells his readers, As obedient children, do not be conformed to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Most of the people to whom Peter is writing were formerly Gentiles who had converted to the Christian faith. Prior to their conversion, they had lived ungodly lives. Peter's letter provides some details about what their former lives looked like. In 1 Peter 4, Peter speaks about how in the past they chose to live as the Gentiles do. Gentile society was polytheistic. The people served a whole pantheon of gods. The God of the sky, the God of the seas, the God of light, the God of war, the God of wine, the goddess of love and pleasure, the goddess of harvest and fertility, among others. Each of these gods required sacrifices and devotion. The temples of these gods were places where people ate festive meals and drank too much and engaged in temple prostitution. This belief system led society to live in a particular way. In the past, also the Christians Peter is writing to had lived their lives trying to fulfill their evil human desires. Peter says that they had spent enough time in the past doing what the pagans do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. So in our text, there's a call for us not to be conformed to the sinful ways of this world. We're not to be led away, led astray by the fleeting pleasures of sin. We need to be on guard against going along with the way that unbelieving people live. They don't have any perspective on life. They don't know that the things of this life will not provide lasting satisfaction. They're often unaware that partying and drunkenness and sexual immorality don't lead to freedom, but to slavery. Jonathan from Aaron recently posted an, about an autobiography written by Matthew Perry, one of the stars of the sitcom Friends. To some among us, Friends can come across as a funny, as a rather harmless sitcom. But it was a vehicle that did more to mainstream the sexual revolution than any other show. Casual hookups and predatory sexual behavior made up the core of this show. Matthew Perry played the role of Chandler Bing in Friends. And off camera, he lived a hedonistic lifestyle that included substance abuse. And he was in and out of rehab for much of his life. In his autobiography, Matthew Perry expresses one of his core regrets in life. It was that he had lived a wildly promiscuous lifestyle. His deepest regret in life was that he had been looking for an hour or two of pleasure with every, with every woman ever invented. Perry writes that during this time he met at least five women that he could have married and had children with. He says, had I done so just once, I would, now, I would not now be sitting in this huge house overlooking the ocean with no one to share it with. Late last year, Perry died of a drug overdose. We, beloved, are not to live disobedient and ungodly lives. Peter calls us to live in holiness he writes, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. What does it mean when our text says that God is holy? Peter is referring to God's moral character. Sin and evil have not stained him. God is completely pure. God is always good. God is distinct from fallen man, who by nature is totally corrupt and inclined to all evil. That's why Peter quotes from Leviticus, where the Lord commands his people, Be holy, because I am holy. 
So what exactly does it mean for us to be holy? Being holy is being set apart from sin. It means being dedicated to God. The call to be holy is central to our text. The very purpose for which God created us was to honor and glorify Him. We were created as God's image bearers. In paradise, our first parents truly knew the Lord. They heartily loved Him. They lived with Him in righteousness and holiness. But the fall into sin changed that. Man's mind became futile. His understanding was darkened. He was separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that was in him due to the hardening of his heart. Jesus Christ came into this world to redeem us from sin and its effects. He came to pay the price for our sins, taking away our guilt, restoring us to the right relationship with God. He came to cause us to be born again that we might rightly know God, love Him, and live with Him in renewed fellowship. We call that our sanctification, the process by which we're made holy. It involves a turning away from our sins and a rededicating of our hearts and our lives to God. Christ renews us from the inside by His Word and Spirit, He expects his work in us to bear fruit in how we live our lives. We're called to live in holiness. What does that mean? What does it look like? Being holy involves our outer conduct. It's shown in the things that we say and do. Being holy involves turning away from sin and evil. Controlling our emotions So we don't make bad decisions in life because we're in love or angry or afraid. Holiness is shown in how we speak. Instead of lying, we'll speak the truth. We'll avoid blasphemy and cursing. Instead of letting unwholesome talk come out of our mouths, we'll use our tongues to build others up. Holiness is also shown in how we live. We'll show respect for those in authority over us. Instead of allowing our hearts to be filled with anger and a desire for revenge, we'll seek to live at peace with those around us and to be reconciled to those we're at odds with. Since we're temples of the Holy Spirit, we'll avoid the things that lead to sexual immorality. Instead of living self-absorbed and extravagant lifestyles, we'll faithfully support those in need. Instead of being covetous, we'll be content with the blessings that the Lord has given us. Yet, beloved, holiness is not just an outward lifestyle. It's a mark of being part of God's family. In verse 14, Peter calls us to be obedient children. And in verse 17, he speaks about us calling on God as Father. The point is simple. If God is not your father, holy living will be impossible for you because holiness is a fruit of being part of God's family. It's only if we've been redeemed by Christ and incorporated in God's family that we're enabled to live holy lives. It's because Christ has bought us and made us his own, because his spirit is at work in us, renewing us, that we're enabled to live in holiness. But this, beloved, is the central call of our text, to be holy, to live in holiness. So the Lord expects from us, out of thankfulness for his redeeming work. Brings us to our final point, and we'll see how Peter calls us to live in holy fear. Our text continues with a final command. Peter says, And if you call on him as father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. With these words, Peter reminds his readers, a final judgment is coming. On the day when Christ returns in the clouds of heaven, he will sit on his throne. 
and everyone who has ever lived on earth will have to come before him to give account. Our text comes with a serious warning. God is an impartial judge. That means he judges fairly. God discerns the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts. God knows the difference between sins of weakness and sins committed in rebellion against him. If we start thinking, oh, I can do this and get away with it, and God will forgive me because he's my father and my friend, then we're on dangerous ground. We should never presume on God's mercy as an excuse to live in sin. The Lord Jesus gave this warning during his earthly ministry. Jesus said that a good tree will bear good fruit and a bad tree bad fruit. He said we will recognize people by their fruits. And then he said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And, I, and then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. God will punish evildoers who live in rebellion against him. Yet, beloved, judgment day should not scare us if we're God's children, redeemed by Christ's blood and renewed by his spirit. On the day of judgment, those who have faith in the Lord Jesus will be acquitted. They will be declared not guilty of their sins. Peter makes this clear in the verses that follow when he speaks about how we were ransomed, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without spot or blemish. Christ's great sacrifice for us on the cross is the ultimate motivation for living a holy life. Peter reminds his readers that while God had planned the way of redemption from before the foundation of the world, it was only made known in the last days. It was made known for their sake that they might share in Christ's wonderful redeeming work. Peter reminds his readers that the same God who gave up his son to die for us raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that their faith and hope would be in God. Striking that again, Peter comes back to the living hope we have in Jesus Christ. The first command Peter gave in our text was to set your hope fully on the grace that we brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's struggling readers needed to fix their focus on heaven from where they await the Lord Jesus Christ. They need to look forward with eager anticipation to Christ's return on the clouds of heaven. Amid their struggles and suffering, they needed that perspective on life. Otherwise, it would be so easy to give up on our faith, to run after the pleasures this world has to offer, to lose out on the glorious inheritance the Lord has in store for all who love him. Beloved, in our text, Peter has given us three commands. To live in hope, to live in holiness, and to live in holy fear. He's given these commands to God's chosen people, bought by Christ's blood, being renewed by his spirit. Are you motivated to live your life in holiness? We should be. For God has delivered us from the passions of our sinful flesh. He did so at the cost of Christ's precious blood. He reminds us of the glorious inheritance in store for all who love him and who seek to do his will by living in obedience to his commands. Let us set our hope fully on the grace that is to come at the revelation of Jesus Christ. For that is when we will be holy 
as God is holy, that's when we will once more be able to perfectly fulfill man's chief purpose in life, to glorify God and enjoy him forevermore. Amen. Let's respond to the gospel message by singing together from the Yellow Supplement, Take My Life and Let It Be, page 94. We'll do so standing.